So let's lean into this. 2 Peter 1, verse 12. Peter says, therefore, I will always remind you about these things. And he's talking about scripture. The heading of this paragraph in my Bible says, paying attention to scripture. He says, I'll always remind you about these things. And even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you've been taught, I feel like that's us. There's a lot of you, you already believe it. You already know it. You're already standing firm, but but he says, it's only right, verse 13, that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. For our Lord Jesus has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life, so I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I am gone. Come on, let's work hard to make sure that we are always coming back to the word of God, rallying around the word of God, believing these things. You already believe them, we're gonna keep reminding ourselves. We're gonna keep encouraging each other towards love and good works, according to the writer of Hebrews. Verse 16, for we were not making up clever stories, there it is, or fairy tales, when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's talking about the first coming of Jesus when he came. He's talking about the writings that they're writing right now. We were not making up stories when we told you about this. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when we received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on that holy mountain, talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, when Peter and John saw the heavens open up and Jesus' face shine like the sun and the glory of God descend upon him. This is why God reveals himself to us, church. This is why you have spiritual encounters. The reason that you have them is so that your revelation of him can be deepened, so that your confidence in him can be strengthened. God gives us revelation of who he is so that our, our conviction can grow stronger, our, our belief in him can grow deeper. And Peter is saying our, our conviction is deep because we saw it with our eyes. And so we weren't just making stuff up as we're writing about this, as we're talking about this. He says, because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. And he's talking now about the Old Testament writings. He's saying, we weren't making it up in the New Testament. They weren't making it up in the Old Testament. You must pay close attention to what they wrote for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. And above all, you must realize that no prophecy, no verse in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Come on, this, this is our foundation for this collection today, part two, where the Bible came from, why it can be trusted. We're gonna look at three topics today. This is almost gonna be like you're in a, a classroom today. Um, so if you're a note taker, I would highly encourage you. I'm telling you now, I'm warning you now, I'd encourage you to take out your phone. If you write old fashioned notes, good for you to get out your pen and get, get your hands ready because I, I'd encourage you honestly to take notes today, okay? So um, if you wanna take them on your phone, take them physically. We're, we're, gonna be, we're gonna go to the classroom as we look at the, the holy scriptures and why they can be trusted. We're gonna look at three topics, all right? So here, here are the three topics and I'm gonna give them to you in advance. The three topics is the canonization process. We're gonna look at the, the canon, what that means, how the, the collection of, of books came together to form the Holy Scriptures. The canonization process, number one. Two, the manuscript evidence. Come on, we got a bunch of fancy words. That's why I put on my coat today. I, wanted, I felt, felt like a professor today. Um, the, the, the manuscript evidence, and then number three, the reason God gave it. The reason God gave it. So, y'all ready to jump in? The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. On the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, boom, boom. All right. Last week, we talked about how the authors were inspired by God according to 2 Timothy 3. I wanna read this again before we jump into how the collection of books were brought together. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture, everybody say all. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are, when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. 
God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. All scripture is inspired by God, which means every author uh, of every book was divinely inspired by God to put pen to paper the words that God had inspired in him. Now, a couple questions that people ask is, did these, did these guys know that they were writing the Bible when they were writing it? The answer is probably not. Uh, we have some scripture evidence in how they were talking about the writings to say that they, they didn't realize how this would all play out necessarily, but we don't fully know what they knew and what God was showing them as they were writing. What we do know is that when these authors, Old Testament and New, were putting pen to paper, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were, the, God himself was directing them in their writing. Did they know it as they wrote it? Likely not. Were they perfect men, some people say? Absolutely not. Were, were these, if, and, and here's another question, if they were imperfect men, then how can we trust the scriptures? The answer again is the Holy Spirit of God. How many know he uses imperfect people to accomplish his will? The Bible says his will is perfect. Well, his will is carried out by imperfect men. That means that a perfect will can be carried out by an imperfect person. Pastor Tony in our transition in person today, if you're watching online, he came up after worship and he referenced Genesis 50, 20. Joseph says, what the enemy meant for evil, God used for good. And his brothers, imperfect as they were, tried to kill him. That was, that was not a good thing. That could be seen as an in disobedience to God, right? But God used that to bring about his perfect plan. Because of Joseph's work in Egypt with Pharaoh and, and the way that it preserved the people of God. Like, God is just crazy big and sovereign like that that even through imperfect and broken people with incomplete understanding of all that God is doing, God is big enough to work his perfect will, to speak his perfect word through imperfect vessels. And so the question is, is usually revolves around how can we trust these men? The answer is you can't, but you can trust God. If you, if you believe that God's not big enough to bring his perfect will through imperfect men, then what you need to do is not focus as much on the imperfect men and come back to how big do you think God is? And so he's worked through imperfect men to put pen to paper the perfect word of God. And the Bible itself says that all scripture is divinely inspired by God. The Holy Spirit has used these men to bring about the word of God. So how were these collection of writings brought together to become the Holy Scripture? That is a question. That is what we would call canonization. The word canon comes from the Greek word canon, canon, K-A-N-O-N. Our English word is C-A-N-O-N, and it's not like a canon it's like canon, C-A-N, singular N-O-N. And this word, this Greek word canon is, this is what it means. It just simply means the measurement or the standard. And so when we say the canon, the biblical canon, what we're referring to are the writings that met the standard of Holy Scripture. When we say the biblical canon, we're talking about the Bible. We're talking about 66 books that have been declared the Holy Word of God, this is your Bible. So the 66 books, 37 Old Testament, 29 New Testament, these books, these writings have been canonized um, by the earliest Christians, declared holy scripture. And some people say, who decided? How did they decide? How do we know what writings made it into the Bible? What writings didn't make it into the Bible? Um, the, the answer, quite literally, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is the Holy Spirit decided. The Holy Spirit directed the word of God not only to be written, but the Holy Spirit divinely and sovereignly directed which books, which writings would be looked at as the Holy Spirit. Scriptures. Now, you must understand the context to understand how it came about. What did not happen, and this is how some of us might think, what did not happen is we didn't have like a hundred writings from these authors and 
in, in 300 AD, the early church fathers look at them and pick out which ones they think were inspired. If you think that, then your, your concern about who picked what is holy and what's not holy would be more valid. It would hold more weight because it's like, well, these guys are the ones that are responsible for declaring what's holy and what's not, but that's not how it came to pass. How it came to pass was much more organic. It was over a much longer period of time. To summarize how it came to pass, starting with the law, as Moses walks off that mountain in Exodus, that word that, that the people saw Moses, come off, he was shining, he had obviously been with God. That word as he came off the mountain, that law became what the, the Hebrew men and women followed. Starting the time that he came off the mountain and all the way through the Old Testament, we see the word of God, the law of God, not only followed and not followed and the, and the consequences of it not followed, we see it meticulously passed down from generation to generation. There didn't need to be a time when somebody said, is the, are the Ten Commandments the Word of God? Is the Levitical law the Word of God? They saw it happen and began following it right away, okay? And so from generation to generation through the Hebrew culture, this was followed to the T, passed down to the T. And they, they followed this word of God, this law of God, the old covenant. We'll talk about it in a minute. And it was never a question, never has been a question. And then the historical books and Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. We see what we see is we see the people of God either following or not following, and the consequences of following or not following the law of God. We see the history of it. We see the prophets. We see the judges that rise up to lead the people of God, and then we see the prophets that are speaking to to what's going to happen if they don't follow, and speaking ahead to the Messiah and the New Covenant. We we get all of the historical books. And that leads all the way up until, and, and the, the people of God are following this as the word of God because it was. They saw it. Eyewitness from generation to generation passed down very meticulously all the way to the time of Jesus when these eyewitnesses saw Jesus and saw him teach and quote this law. They, they watched him do miracles. They watched him die, and then they watched him rise. They put pen to paper wrote, and wrote about it. These eyewitnesses, can not only put pen to paper, but they also passed on this, this, these stories from generation to generation. And now these words, and even before we close the canon, even before the scriptures are done being written, you see Peter referencing the words of Paul as Holy Scripture. Like before the Bible even is completed, they're already referencing the writing of who Jesus is and what he did as the Holy Scriptures of God. And so from the earliest of churches, they begin to follow these writings. And so here's how the canon comes to be. It is the early church fathers recognizing what was already there. So follow me. It was never a question. And, and this should help some of you, some, of, some that, that struggle with the doubt of like, is this real or is this not real? This was eyewitness stuff. It would have been stomped out. It would have been put out. It would have been destroyed if it didn't happen because it was happening in real time and people were dying for writing it. And so they're, they're writing what's happening. They're losing their lives for it. But the message continues because it really, really happened. And it was always acknowledged. There, was never, there were never arguments over, is this the word of God? This is what happened. And it's being followed as the word of God. And so by 300 AD, there is, it is canonized. It is like, and there were some bits and pieces, not to refer to the Bible as bits and pieces, but third John and Jude and a couple small parts of the New Testament, the early church fathers had to have counsel and come together and, and look at the evidence and look at the accuracy and, and the, look at the literature from a scientific perspective and decide what belonged in it. But for the most part, this was already unarguably being followed as the divinely inspired word of God. God. And so the canonization process was about recognizing what was already obviously the word of God. That's how it happened. I want to read this excerpt that succinctly describes it, and then we'll move to, to point number two. This is about the canonization of scripture. When it came to the Old Testament, three important facts were considered in the canonization of scripture. The New Testament, this is number one, the New Testament quotes from or alludes to every Old Testament book except two. And we'll get into a minute why you can trust the New Testament, the most historically accurate piece of ancient literature that's ever existed. 
and these writers refer to the Old Testament as Holy Scripture, every single book of the Old Testament except two. The second is Jesus endorsed the Hebrew canon in Matthew 23, 35 when he cited one of the first narratives and one of the last narratives in the scriptures of his day. Number, so Jesus himself endorses it. And so if you're gonna roll with Jesus, you have to endorse the Old Testament as canon, as, as holy scripture, because he did. And number three is the Jews were meticulous in preserving the Old Testament scriptures. We talked about that. And they had few, if any, controversies over what parts belong or not belong from the Old Covenant scriptures. On the contrary, the Roman Catholic Apocrypha, as an example, did not measure up, fell outside of the definition of scripture, and has never been accepted by the Jews, by the people of God. Most questions about which books belong in the Bible dealt with writings from the time of Christ and forward. The early church had some very specific criteria in order for books to be considered as part of the canon of the New Testament, and these included, was the book written by someone who is an eyewitness of Jesus Christ? Did the book pass the truth test? In other words, did it concur with other already agreed upon unanimously points of scripture? The New Testament books that they accepted back then have endured the test of time and Christian orthodoxy and, has, and Christian orthodoxy has embraced these with little challenge for centuries. Confidence in the acceptance of specific books dates back to the first century recipients who offered firsthand testimony as to their authority and furthermore, the end time subject matter of the book of Revelation and the prohibition of adding to the words or taking away argue strongly that the canon was closed at the time of, his, of its writing in AD 95. Church, there is strong historical evidence, scholarly evidence that shows the accuracy, obviously not only of the words that were written, but the way that the word of God came together and has been unanimously by Christians for centuries followed. And the first time, we talked about this last week, the first time for a major, for majority of the church, this is the first time in history over the last hundred years in our postmodern culture that there are parts of the Bible that are being challenged as true. And some of these postmodern liberal theology, progressive theologians that are off of their rocker are challenging the Bible with philosophical presuppositions, trying to pass scholarly sounding arguments, trying to challenge the word of God. They're all built on a faulty argument that the Bible is not historically accurate. And the only people that believe it aren't smart people. The only people that believe it are people that read the internet, don't fact check it, and just take that hook, line, and sinker, and then therefore they're gonna go along with the rest of whatever argument that they're trying to give. Which, Always, I'll say this again later, always, whenever there's an argument against the inerrancy and the authority of scripture, there's always an agenda. It's to worship another idol. You're never just arguing with the scripture randomly. It's because you are trying to justify something that God has said is wrong. Take it to the bank. The second thing, I'm gonna speak, gotta speed up a little bit here. The second thing, the manuscript evidence. You might wanna take notes, if you weren't taking notes, now you wanna, might wanna pick it up here. The manuscript evidence, Old Testament manuscript evidence. The Old Testament law, prophets and writings were all based on the law God gave on Mount Sinai. That covenant is the basis for the entire New Testament. And not only has, been the, has the law been passed down from generation to generation, but as we said, has been quoted and recorded in the New Testament about 300 times. The New Testament refers to the Old Testament as Holy Scripture. And original copies of pieces of the Old Testament have been discovered thousands of years later and found to be identical without variation from each other. This is huge, this is huge. Um, for example, listen to this, the scroll of Isaiah, so the book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah a copy of an original manuscript of the book of Isaiah was found 70 years ago, 7-0, 70 years ago, and is 11 to 1,200 years, archaeologists say, 11 to 1,200 years older than our previous oldest copy of Isaiah, but was found to be identical down to the last detail. You can't make it up. 1,100 years older than our previous oldest copy, and it's identical. Why? Because it's the word of God. New Testament manuscript evidence we can look at and have 
even more historical evidence to back it up. By far the most ancient, by the most accurate piece of ancient literature that exists when it comes to the manuscript evidence that we have. You might have heard before that one of the ways to measure the validity and the accuracy of ancient literature is the time between when the literature was written and the earliest manuscript that we have. Some of you have probably heard this before if you've done any study. In many arguments against the Bible, uh, people will tout these false claims that the Bible is, is made up. It's a fantasy, that we have no way of knowing that it actually happened. The problem is, for these people that are touting these claims, the problem is that's a fantasy. Um, that's false. Because the manuscript evidence for the Bible is the strongest of any ancient literature that we look to. We don't question that Aristotle wrote what he wrote. We don't question that Plato wrote what he wrote. We don't question that Julius Caesar wrote what he wrote. We don't question that Herodotus wrote what he wrote. We don't question what Tacitus wrote that he, what he wrote. We teach this in school. It's widely accepted. It's not even challenged. Um, but let's look at the manuscript evidence for some of these historical pieces of Greek literature. Julius Caesar. Um, in his writings, we have an original copy of one of his pieces of literature, and the, the earliest original copy that we have of his writing is a 1,000 years after he originally wrote it. So we have a copy that's a 1,000 years old, and that is actually seen to be not bad when it comes to the time in between an original copy and it, when it was originally written in the original copy that we have. Um, Tacitus, the Roman historian, the gap is the same. It's about 1,000 1, years from the time he wrote it to the original, first original copy that we have. Herodotus, the ancient Greek historian and geographer known as the father of all historians in Greek culture. Um, we have uh, one piece of his ancient literature that's 1,350 years after his original writing. No one questions it. The smallest gap of time that we have in the most historical, historically accurate piece of literature that we have from Greek culture um, that no one argues and is taught in every school is Homer's Iliad. How many have heard of Homer's Iliad, the Iliad and the Odyssey? So let me tell you about Homer's Iliad. It's not 1,000 years or 1,350 years, much more accurate than that. Um, we, have, um, we have a couple of copies of Homer's Iliad, and these copies were from 400 years after he wrote it, only 400 years. So this is a couple generations of people. Um, after he originally wrote, we have a copy from 400 years after. This is widely accepted, right? Watch this. What about the New Testament? Is it 1,350 years between when it was written and when we have our first copy? Is it 1,000 years from, from when it was written to when we have our first copy? Was it 400 years? As impressive as Homer's Iliad that we have the first copy from the original writing? No. Uh, in fact, the earliest evidence that we have of original manuscript is a piece of the writing from the Gospel of John that we have an original manuscript that dates to 30 years after John wrote it. 30, three zero. In other words, everyone was still alive. We have this 30-year-old piece. He wrote it, and we have a manuscript from 30 years later. In fact, we have 100 portions of New Testament manuscript within the first 100 years of when they were written. And we have a complete copy of the entire New Testament, 29 books and writings. We have a completed copy of the entire New Testament that is from 300 AD, only 200 years after the first written manuscript. We have an original copy of the entire New Testament. In fact, we have two of them, and one is currently located in the British Library in London. You could go see it today. The actual copy from 200 years after it was originally written. For most ancient literature, we have one to four original manuscripts, four being the most, providing a, a high level of, of, um, of evidence that this writing is actually accurate. Four um, manuscripts would be the most, but for most of the manuscripts, most of the writing, the literature that we um, agree on unanimously that it's accurate, there is one to two copies. Now, a lot of the, the copies, the literature that I just referenced, it's one to two manuscripts that range from between 400 and 1,500 years after it was originally written. But listen to this. Today, 
We have, from the first 400 years after the Bible was written, we have 6,000 complete original copies of the New Testament. Come on, if you're a believer in Jesus, this should, this should fire you up because it flies in the face of the claim that the Bible is not accurate. 6,000 original handwritten copies because there was no printing press. Can't throw it on the Xerox machine. Which means there was a lot of energy and time. Maybe these guys were willing to suffer and sacrifice not only time and energy, but maybe they were willing to give up their lives because it actually happened. Why do we have 6,000 original copies? And why do we have 20,000 copies from the first 400 years in other languages translated from Greek? The manuscript evidence is overwhelming. On top of that, The writers died because of what they wrote. The people who wrote it were killed because of the threat that it gave to the government and the leaders of their day. Because in that day, those governmental leaders were not just seen as governmental leaders. They were seen, they thought of themselves and the people had to act as if they were God. And so the Bible was a threat to their authority and the people that wrote these scriptures. We got 6,000 copies were crucified. The apostles crucified for what they wrote, what they believed, and what they said. Many early Christians crucified, killed, persecuted because they wrote what they believed, what they said, what they copied, what they were passing around. The, The Bible has been severely attacked and the people are not around because they copied it. The people are not around because they wrote it, but what they wrote still is because it's the word of God. It is is the living, breathing, divinely inspired word of God. And you can can trust it. Not a dot, not, not an iota, as we read, has been taken away or lost. And still, over 2,000 years later, and many thousands for the Old Testament before that, we still have it. Because God protected it. Because, because, and this takes us to reason three, the reason God gave it, why did he, why did he protect it? Why did he write it? Why did he give it to us? Because the Bible, are you ready for this? Write this down, is a covenant between God and his people. Here's the whole point of scripture. The whole point of scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, is that God was making a covenant with us. Um, as if the, 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 the spouses, the husband and the wife the bride and the groom make vows to each other at the altar. God himself, the groom that has given his life for his bride that he created and is in this love relationship with his people, and that's you and I. It, it, it is the, the vows. It, it is what holds us together. It is the covenant. It is, it's the terms, the conditions. It is the rules of engagement. It is how this relationship is going to work. The Bible is, in essence, at its foundation, the Bible is a covenant for God and us. It's what holds our relationship together. It's what sets the tone for how we act and how we see God and how we receive what he's done. And here's what you need to know. God gave it in context, in a context that the people would understand. He gave his covenant in a context that the people would understand. In Middle Eastern culture in the second millennium BC, here's what would happen. Kings would conquer a nation, conquer a land, And when they conquered the nation or the land, they would make a treaty or a covenant. Those words can be used interchangeably, almost the same thing, treaty, covenant. There would be a treaty or a covenant that was made between the king and the people. And it would lay out the relationship between king and conquered people. All right, this is what, in this culture, this is what would happen. Um, And there are a few common elements of every treaty, of every covenant in this culture that would be given between a king and his conquered people. God gives his covenant because he is king and we are his conquered people. The difference is he's not a king that wants to rule over us over us, and make our lives worse just as servants unto the king. He is a king that loves his children and wants to act not as king um, amongst his servants, but a father to his children. This conquering king loves his people. This conquering king, 
king has created his people. This conquering king loves his people. This conquering king wants the best for his people. This conquering king blesses his people. This conquering king shows his people how to thrive. This conquering king wants his people to live in freedom within the bounds of the, the world that he's created and the law that he's created. And, he, and, and he's given the, us these principles and these laws for our betterment, not for his. He, he, this conquering king created a covenant that would lead his beloved son to a cross for his beloved children. And so there are a few elements, and I'll, I'll run through these elements really fast because I need to close. And the element number one is that every treaty came in written form. So if it was only in oral form, then, then things could be changed. Things could be lost in, in translation, tele, game of telephone. It's gonna be different by the time it gets, so it had to be written. It had to be written. So every treaty had to be in written form. That's why God didn't just give us the spoken word. He wrote his word so that we would have something tangible to grab a hold of. This, these treaties would come in written form. God gave us the Bible, his word, in written form. All right, you following? Element number two, about a common element of these treaties and, and the, the covenant that God gave us is every treaty had two copies. So let me teach you this. When, when Moses comes off the mountain with the, the covenant between God and his people, he comes off with two copies. You can read about it. Um, and I used to think that the first stone was commandments one through five and the second stone was commandments six through 10. Everyone, anybody ever thought that? It's not, that's not. It's, it's, it wasn't one through five and six through 10. It was one through five on the front, six through 10 on the back, and there were two copies because this was a covenant an official covenant between a king and his people. Now, in ancient time, one copy, much like a contract today, if there's a contract between two parties, there's two copies, each party has one. In ancient culture, one of the copies had to be in the presence of the conquering king. The other copy had to be kept in a safe and sacred, secure place amongst the conquered people. If you know anything about the Old Testament, where were the two copies of the law of God kept? In the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, which was both the presence of the conquering king and a safe and sacred place amongst the conquered people because we have a God who is gracious enough to dwell amongst his people, not separate from us, but amongst us. His presence dwelt in that ark in the old covenant. Now it dwells in our heart because of what Jesus did, tearing the veil, bringing his presence into our lives. But even in the old covenant, they carried the presence of God with them as the tabernacle would move. The presence of God as the temple was built was in the Holy of Holies. It was amongst the people. And so both copies of this covenant, both copies of the treaty, both copies of the agreement were in the same place because it's where the king was, that's where the people were. Element three, the treaty could not be altered or taken away. We talked about this last week. The Bible itself says about itself after the old covenant is written and after the new covenant is written in both spots. In Deuteronomy 4, 2, you can find it says, do not add to what I command to you. Do not subtract from it. Keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, that I give you. There are there is a, a stern warning against adding or taking away. Old covenant, now let's go to the new covenant. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. After the new covenant is established, the last, some of the last words in all of the Bible, I warn anyone who hears these words of prophecy of this scroll, and that's the, the, the Bible, that if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes these words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. These should be sobering words of warning. This is, this is, this is it, it feels heavy, but sometimes we need to be brought back to, hey, this is a serious deal taking away from the word of God, watering it down, undermining parts of scripture, thinking that you know best and that we gotta fit this thing into culture. And we, no, 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 the words of warning are, take it away, you're gonna suffer. Add, add to it, you're gonna suffer. You're gonna miss out on the tree of life and everything that God has in, in his kingdom coming and, and, and enjoying the benefits of heaven. Like there are consequences for altering this covenant that has been made. And like I said, the only reason that people undermine it is always for the purpose of worshiping another idol. Let's be careful in, in our either accidental or purposeful, subconscious or conscious altering of the word of God. And then element four, the treaty had consequences of disobedience. There's consequences if you disobey the king's treaty, right? 
And if you read the Old Testament and the New, you see consequences of disobeying the word of God. All throughout the historical books of the Old Testament, we see the consequences of disobedience over and over and the jealous and just nature of God for his people. He's jealous for his people. That's not jealous in a bad way, like he wants something that you have. He's jealous literally for you. He loves you. He doesn't want your soul captured by other things. He wants your heart. He wants a relationship with you. And because of his jealousy for his people and because of his just nature, you see the consequences of disobedience over and over again, which is in line with his will because he wants what's best for us. But here's how I'll close today. The amazing thing is as Jesus comes into the picture to a broken world, struggling to keep their end of the covenant, struggling to keep up their end of of what's supposed to happen, failing time and time again. I don't know about you, but when I read the Old Testament, a lot of times I feel uh, equally equally in in a holy fear of God, but also like feeling a little better about myself because I'm like, these people were normal. They had, they, had some, they had some trouble like, like, like living out what God said. Sometimes they didn't have the, the, the power, they didn't have the discipline to do what he said and we see that over and over again but arrives Jesus to fulfill and renew the covenant. Fulfilled because he came as a man he, he, didn't, he didn't come just as God. He came as God and man. Therefore, he could fulfill our end of the covenant and he lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. But also renewed because after he fulfills the covenant by going to a cross and dying a sinner's death because the wages of sin is death and in the law, death was required for disobedience to God. So he dies as a man. Also, he dies as a lamb of God because that was a way to appease the wrath of God was to bring a perfect lamb. He dies as lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He dies as substitutionary atonement. He dies for you and he dies for me. He hung on the cross as you. He hung on the cross as me. He took on the state of sin, even though he had no sin. And in a marvelous and powerful way, fulfills our end of the covenant for us when we couldn't fulfill it for ourselves. And then also he renews it. And he establishes the new covenant, as he would say, a new covenant of my blood. And thank God it's his blood. Because now we don't have to shed, we don't have to bring a lamb up to the altar of this church and sacrifice it during worship. Aren't you grateful? That would be weird. But Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who's taken away the sin of the world. And so when we lift our hand and we offer our lives as a sacrifice of praise, that is us celebrating God for the blood that he's shed and celebrating God for the, 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 the atonement of sin, the satisfying of the wrath of God. And now I can live today in freedom and confidence and boldness before God, not because I'm perfect, but because he was perfect. And he establishes this new covenant for us. And Jeremiah writes this in Jeremiah 31, 31. I'm gonna read a couple scriptures to close, I promise. Here we go, piano's playing, scriptures are being read. We're we're bringing this thing to a close. Jeremiah writes, behold, the days are coming. This is the old covenant. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. There's the, the symbolism of of husband and and bride. He says, even though I was their husband, they broke their side of the covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Thank you, Jesus. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each of his brothers saying, know the Lord. In other words, they don't have to force it for they shall all know me from the least of the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Praise Jesus. Matthew 26, when Jesus is eating the last supper with his disciples before he goes to the cross to once and for all fulfill the old and begin the new covenant, it says as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it and then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant, the new covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. And I close with Hebrews 9, verse 13. The writer says, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. 
Just think about how much more the blood of Christ will purify our conscience, our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And that is why he is the one who now mediates a new covenant between God and his people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance that God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins that they had committed under that first covenant. It's no longer a law that mediates our relationship with God. It is Jesus Christ himself, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And today we worship him. Today we receive him. And by receiving and worshiping him, we have access to the almighty and holy and perfect God that we wouldn't have access to otherwise. So today we say, thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've done. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness and your sacrifice of sin. Thank you, Jesus for going to the cross. We live lives of worship to you today. So we don't worship him void. You can stand if you're not already. We don't worship him void of the the Old Testament, void of the meaning of the Bible. We stand on the word of God. It brings more meaning to our worship. It brings more passion to our worship. It brings a depth to our worship that we wouldn't otherwise have. God didn't just turn away and and decide to forget about sin. He looked sin in the face and Jesus looked sin in the face and he says, my God, why have you forsaken me? He carries the weight of sin on the cross and he feels the wrath of his father to the point where it says the father actually, in that moment, Jesus felt the absence of the father because he felt the presence of sin. And he took that for you, he took that for me. Today, in a high school auditorium or wherever you're watching from, we have the privilege of experiencing the presence of God. Not because God changed, but because God came. And we have confidence in his word today. So God, we just thank you for your word. And as we sing this next song, we're gonna have a moment where we just say thank you. Maybe some people are gonna go take communion together. Maybe if you're at home, you wanna receive communion yourself wherever you are. Maybe we wanna just take a moment and acknowledge again the magnitude of what you've done. But right now I wanna do this. If you're here in this place and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're gonna do what we do every week and I'm not gonna spend much time on this. I I wanna just ask you, do you have a relationship with Jesus? If not, this is your moment to say yes to him. Everybody here is invited. Everybody watching is invited. If you've never received him, what does receiving him mean? It means trusting in him, not you. Believing that he's the savior of the world, that he died on the cross and rose from the dead. When you do, it's more than an intellectual decision. It's a spiritual experience because the Bible says when we believe in him, our sins are forgiven. So if you don't believe in him and you want to today, or you've drifted from trusting in him and you wanna come back to him today, When I count to three, I want you to lift your hand in this place. I'm not gonna embarrass you or call you out, but I wanna know who I'm praying with today. If you're online, let us know. Send us a message or put it in the comments. I'm receiving Jesus as my savior. And we're gonna say a prayer, all of us out loud saying, Jesus, you're our savior, forgive our sins. And then we're gonna sing. So all across this room, if if you want Jesus Christ to be your savior, you want the reality of what we've been talking about today to be in your life, lift a hand when I say three. One, two, three. Come on, lift a hand if that's you. You wanna receive Jesus. I see you, God bless you. Anybody else wanna lift a hand? Say, I'm receiving Jesus. Christ as my savior today. I wanna put my faith in him and my trust in him. When you do, he forgives sin. Anybody wanna join this one? Lift your hand right now. Lift your hand right now. Let us know online if that's you. Awesome, let's say a prayer. Can we all pray this together with this one precious soul in this room, at least, who's praying this prayer? Let's, you repeat this after me. Let's put our faith in Jesus. Here we go, here we go. God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. And Jesus, I receive you into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of my sin. I repent and I turn to you. I wanna live every day for you, Jesus, and accomplish the purpose you have for me. Thank you for what you've done. Amen and amen. Come on, let's celebrate everybody that's prayed that prayer today.